Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage. Today's garbage is Ghostbusters 2016, a movie about Pringles, Papa John's Pizza, and Sony electronic products. If you're this movie's target audience, you might be too stupid to have guessed that this is going to be a negative review. And just like every other negative review of this movie on the internet, I'm going to preface it by saying that my dislike for this movie has nothing to do with the fact that it has a majority female cast, but everything to do with it being a bad movie. I shouldn't have to say that, but I wanted to get a head start on all the recreationally offended cry bullies on the internet. Now, I will say that watching this movie wasn't as painful as I thought it would be. But then again, I said the same thing when I got stabbed that one time. My expectations were so low that there's no way this movie could have possibly failed to surpass them. So that's one thing it has going for it. I mean, anything looks good compared to diabetes, AIDS, cancer, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, and copromensis. But that isn't to say I thought this movie was good. Just because this movie stopped short of killing me, that doesn't mean it isn't still terrible. And before I get started, let me mention that I'm going to be making a lot of comparisons between this movie and the original Ghostbusters from 1984. Understand that my complaint is not that this movie is different from the old movie, but that this movie is not as good as the old one. And I have to highlight the differences between them to form a basis of comparison in order to explain why this movie utterly failed to live up to the standards set by the old one. So no, I'm not just a nostalgic old man who hates things that are different. I'm a cynical old man who hates Hollywood cash grabs. I wouldn't even call myself a Ghostbusters fan. I just know a bad movie when I see one, unlike the so-called professional critics. Oh yeah, that's something I should mention. Ghostbusters 2016 is so bad that I honestly can't believe that anyone over the age of 7 or with an IQ over 70 genuinely enjoys it on any sort of unironic level. I'm convinced that the positive reviews from professional critics are all totally bogus, and since the idea that any of them actually like it is simply impossible in my eyes, because I would lose all faith in humanity if I didn't believe that, then there are only three possible explanations. 1. Sony bribed the critics to give the movie positive reviews, which is something they've actually been caught doing before. 2. The critics are feminists who refuse to admit that the movie is as bad as it is, after getting caught up in Sony's disingenuous, misogynist don't like a female empowerment movie marketing strategy. Or 3. The critics pretended the movie is better than it really is because they were afraid of being called sexist due to Sony's aforementioned disingenuous marketing strategy. Speaking of which, yes, it's true, this movie has no d So even though gender is a social construct and doesn't matter, I guess we're all supposed to celebrate the fact that these characters are female, and we're all supposed to like them specifically because they're female, and we're sexist if we don't, okay? I'm just gonna get this out of the way before I start talking about the actual movie. It's basically impossible to talk about Ghostbusters 2016 without also talking about the controversy and politics surrounding it. Which is pretty sad considering a Ghostbusters movie is the last thing in the world that should be politicized. That's stupid. Everything's political. No it isn't. Just because you're incapable of self-reflection and you shove politics in everything you say and do, and this causes you to project political motivations onto everyone else, and you're now incapable of seeing things as they are, and feel the need to inject your bias into everything and make everything about your pet issues through eisegesis, that doesn't mean everything is meant to be viewed through an ideological lens. Not everything is an allegory for the struggles of the proletariat, or the intersection of race and justice, or whatever bullshit your English professor told you. Just because all you have is a hammer, that doesn't mean everything is a nail. LOL, you're dumb. When we say everything is political, that just means all media is a product of the cultures that produce it, and it can't be separated from that context. Media encompasses all human experience, and so do politics, therefore all media is political. First of all, that's not the same as saying everything is political, because the word political has a dictionary definition which you are conveniently ignoring. Politics don't encompass all human experience, and only an idiot would say it does. That or a totalitarian who thinks all art which doesn't support their party is dangerous. Second, even if that's all it meant, maybe you should stop saying everything is political as a rhetorical cudgel to shut down criticisms of propaganda disguised as entertainment, or media being cynically redesigned to insincerely appeal to the current socio-political climate for no reason other than it's what some studio executive thinks will get stupid people who seek validation from pop culture to buy tickets and merchandise, because that's clearly not what's being argued, you disingenuous weasel. Oh look, the evil corporation who runs sweatshops in China changed their icon on Twitter to the pride flag. Let's buy some sneakers. 
You're the exact type of person this movie was made for. A stupid consumerist moron who thinks they're smarter than they really are because they read the New York Times. Get the f*** out of my sight. Yes, sir. Now what was I saying? I should point out that although the movie itself only vaguely hints at a political message in bits and pieces... You shoot like girls. Safety lights are for dudes. The controversy has less to do with the movie itself and more to do with the marketing and the behavior of the filmmakers and their simps in the media and the months before the film's release. I think it's safe to say that if it weren't for this controversy, the movie would have been forgotten immediately and I wouldn't even be talking about it now. So if you're one of the people who defended Ghostbusters 2016 by crying misogyny and now you have a problem with my video, just know that this video is your fault. Long story short, fans of the original Ghostbusters have been waiting to get a third installment of the franchise which had been talked about on and off in Hollywood for decades before that dream was finally crushed once and for all when Sony announced that they planned to reboot the franchise entirely. Sometime later, it was announced that the new Ghostbusters would have an all-female cast, and fans immediately began to suspect that it was some kind of attempt to make a political statement about feminism or to forsake their established fan base and attempt to appeal to a new one. As Sony should have predicted, the apprehension of the fan base was palpable. Then the first trailer came out. Fans watched it and were dismayed by the zany cartoon antics and cheesy special effects reminiscent of the live-action Scooby-Doo movie, and they voiced their discontent. The trailer became the most disliked movie trailer on all of YouTube, with over a million dislikes within months of the video going up. But then the media outlets chimed in and started accusing the movie's detractors of misogyny, zeroing in on the few sexist comments the trailer got while ignoring all of the legitimate criticism. Even the filmmakers jumped on the bandwagon and started disparaging the outraged fans as sexists, and there are even rumors that Sony went so far as to start deleting negative comments from the trailer, leaving only the sexist ones in order to lend credibility to this narrative. And that's just rich, isn't it? The thought that Sony, of all companies, would play up the whole feminist angle, while Sony executive Amy Pascal, the woman who produced this movie, publicly defended the practice of paying actresses less than their male counterparts. Of course, the idea that so many people hate this movie purely because it stars women is absurd on the face of it. I mean, yeah, of course some people hated it for that reason, but when you look at other then-recent female-led movies which have been successful and don't have anywhere near as many dislikes on YouTube, movies such as Frozen, The Hunger Games, Mad Max Fury Road, The Force Awakens, and Zootopia, it becomes clear that mainstream audiences aren't as sexist as the media or Sony's marketing team would want us to believe. But the difference between all of those movies and this Ghostbusters reboot is that those movies all actually fall somewhere between slightly better than this movie to actually good. And the marketing for those movies didn't feel the need to play up the fact that they had female leads and make it seem like it was a bigger deal than it really was. I mean, imagine if you were watching Fury Road and Furiosa turned to Max and said, I may be a woman, but I can do anything a man can do, and then proceeded to emasculate Immortan Joe by zapping him in the balls. It's the same thing with a lot of other popular female action heroes, like Ellen Ripley from Aliens, Sarah Connor from Terminator, or The Bride from Kill Bill. At no point do they ever feel the need to rub their gender in anyone's faces. I mean, imagine if a man rubbed his gender in your face. He'd go to prison. Those characters also don't cry sexism whenever something bad happens to them. Okay, so I don't know if it was a race thing or a lady thing, but I'm mad as hell. And the reason for that is because their gender is incidental and ultimately doesn't matter. And I think the fact that they treat gender like it doesn't matter is ultimately more pro-gender equality than any character who treats the fact that they have a vagina as their core defining characteristic and constantly draws attention to it. You know, Amy, anytime someone calls attention to the breaking of gender rules, it ultimately undermines the concept of gender equality by implying that this is an exception and not the status quo. Predictably, this controversy baiting resulted in an even stronger backlash, and surprising to no one but the media and Sony themselves, the movie tanked at the box office. With a total gross of only $229 million, this movie didn't even break even, making it a gigantic, embarrassing failure and causing Sony to abandon their plans to turn Ghostbusters into a big cinematic universe. Oh, what, what? I guess maybe going out of your way to insult and alienate your core fan base by calling them sexists and man babies is not the best way to get people to want to see your movie. Who to thunk it? That's not fair. Ghostbusters got banned in China, and movies need to be distributed in China to be profitable now. 
Well, gee, not being shown in China didn't stop Joker from making a billion dollars, despite the R rating and the media trying to convince us it was racist or going to incite a violent incel uprising. We sure do live in a society, don't we? Now, I don't know for certain if this is THE reason why Ghostbusters 2016 failed, but I could say that pissing off the fans certainly didn't help. But I am somewhat suspicious that Sony may have realized they had a bad movie on their hands, and so they engineered this controversy themselves. It would make sense if they deleted the negative comments off the YouTube trailer to give the most misogynistic ones the spotlight, like they are trying to rile up the feminists to get them to see this movie because they knew the core fanbase would be displeased with it. As I already pointed out, for as much controversy this movie generated over its all-female cast, the fact that it has an all-female cast has very little bearing on the actual movie itself. The fact that the main characters are women is mostly incidental within the context of the film. You can change the genders of any of the characters that make the cast any combination of male and female, and it wouldn't really affect the story much at all. This in itself is not a bad thing, and in another movie you could even say it's a good thing, but it just goes to show that the decision to make the cast all female, despite it having no bearing on the plot, was nothing more than an ill thought out marketing gimmick. I'm honestly shocked the movie didn't try to make some point about the lack of women in STEM fields, or sexism in academia or something. But all the filmmakers cared about was drumming up controversy for publicity. This is worse than tokenism. It's commodification. How are all you feminists out there not insulted? The only reason you're criticizing this movie is because you have a problem with equal representation. You don't want girls to have positive role models because you support the patriarchy. Oh yes, I'm sure the decision to gender swap the Ghostbusters had nothing at all to do with drumming up controversy in order to generate free publicity for the cynical cash grab of a movie. And it was entirely because the executives of Sony care just oh so much about promoting the idea to little girls that they too can grow up to become fat, unfunny experts in a fictional science. Furthermore, if your goal is to promote gender equality, then maybe a better way to do that would be to portray equality by having an equal number of both male and female Ghostbusters, as opposed to this girl power LOL boys suck exclusionary girls only club bull that does nothing but alienate half of your potential audience and come across as extremely hypocritical when you claim to be fighting against sexism. Anyway, even after that strategy failed, Sony still felt the need to put the Rotten Tomatoes certified fresh stamp on the box. Tell me this doesn't come across like a way of saying f you to all the detractors while desperately trying to make their money back through DVD sales. I already mentioned that I'm not convinced that any of the critics who gave this movie a positive review actually liked it, but to support my case further, the majority of the positive reviews I've seen seem to have difficulty articulating why they liked it other than to say it was funny, or some variant of it stars women and this somehow automatically makes it good. And then the rest of the review is just a bunch of filler going on about how so many trolls were bashing the movie for having women in it, or just explaining what happens in the movie without explaining why it's good or bad. None of them ever praised it for having expressive cinematography, coherent editing, a plot that makes sense, relevant themes, relatable characters with understandable motivations, riveting action and suspense, an emotional impact, or any of the other stuff that makes a movie good. Maybe that's because this movie doesn't have any of that, and these critics are just talking out of their asses to push a narrative. I'm honestly shocked by the number of reviews I've seen praising just how funny the Mike Hat scene was. The joke is literally, Mike Hat sounds like my cat. Are you people really so desperate to avoid admitting how terrible the movie was that you need to latch onto this and hold it up as your go-to example of a funny moment in this movie? A moment in which the plot comes to a dead stop in order to make a stupid and overly long wordplay joke? You can't be serious. I refuse to believe that. And if you are serious, what does it say that the funniest joke in a supposedly pro-feminist girl power movie was improvised by a male actor? On the other hand, every negative review of this movie that I've seen has made it clear that their dislike for this movie has nothing at all to do with the fact that it has an all-female cast, but everything to do with things like plot, humor, production values, acting, and things like that. But almost every one of them has felt the need to specifically point this out in order to deflect accusations of misogyny. Just like what happened to James Rolfe. They practically tried to publicly crucify him. Wow, how dare he have an opinion that doesn't toe the line. Better make an example of him, right? By the way, I invite you to watch James's video. He never said anything that could even remotely be construed as misogynistic. Literally all he did say was that he wasn't going to see the movie. What a sexist, right? Now, even with all this bull 
trying to make people afraid to dislike the movie, it still flops. And there's still countless reviews out there calling it the piece of that it is. It would seem that trying to shut down opinions you don't like by calling people sexist doesn't work anymore. So as I continue this review and analysis and carefully explain everything that's wrong with this movie, I think it will become clear that my dislike for this movie has nothing to do with the fact that it has an all-female Yeah, I just a woman hating misogynist. Why don't you judge your privilege, you white male cis head shit world? <laughs> I am annoyed beyond the capacity for rational thought. Alright, I guess I'm gonna explain what actually happens in the movie now. And I'll be doing it through the lens of Frank Daniel's 8 sequence model, which is a common tool used to structure a screenplay for optimum pacing in which, once it's pointed out to you, you will notice and be conscious of while watching every movie you ever see from now on, and you'll become a pedantic, overly analytical who nobody likes to hang out with, like me. Act 1, Sequence 1, Status Quo and Inciting Incident. The movie starts with some asshole giving a tour of the old Aldridge Mansion in New York, which is now a museum. Some half-assed excuses for jokes are attempted. It's said that in this very room, P.T. Barnum first had the idea to enslave elephants. And he gives this detailed backstory about how the psychotic daughter of the family, Gertrude, killed a bunch of people. So they locked her up in the basement, which, to me, makes her the most relatable character. But the movie can't resist the urge to undermine the seriousness of the scene by throwing in a stupid joke. Sir Aldridge once wrote in his diary, I know God makes no mistakes, but I believe he may have been drunk when he built Gertrude's personality. This guy goes on to explain that the house was eventually bought by another owner, and they found Gertrude's remains in the basement and started hearing ghost noises, so they sealed the door and no one has opened it since. A candle falls over, and the guests get scared, so he ends the tour. And as they walk by, the camera zooms in on some glowing hidden device under a piece of furniture. Sometime later, the tour guy is about to leave and it's revealed that the candle was rigged to tip over as part of the show. But then he hears the doorknob squeaking. <laughs> the guy gets attacked by the ghost of Gertrude in an over-the-top spectacle with shit flying all over the place and loud bombastic music blaring, and this dumbass runs into the basement where green slime seeps up through the cracks in the floor. The stairs collapse, and the guy screams as the ghost approaches, and then we get the title sequence. This whole scene takes up the first five minutes of the movie. Now, in a typical two-hour movie like this one, the inciting incident will happen about 15 minutes in. And the first 15 minutes before then are valuable time which should be spent building up the world and the characters and getting us interested in them. The movie spends a good chunk of that time on this guy, the mansion, this ghost, and her backstory. Normally, when you spend five minutes explaining the whole backstory of a character and how she died and became an evil ghost, the audience will assume that character will be important to the plot of the movie, like she's gonna be a major villain or something, but that doesn't happen. Gertrude appears for two more scenes, one of which is later in the first act, and the other of which is in the stupid pointless battle scene in the third act, where she appears for about four seconds before getting blown away without any fanfare, and she's never mentioned once in between. So I'm wondering, why do they spend so much time building up this character if she's so unimportant that the Ghostbusters just shoot her without a second thought, as if she's just yet another ghost in an army of ghosts? Was it just a waste of time? They might as well have spent all that time building up any one of these random no-name ghosts. Why not give Slimer a backstory? Oh, I know why they didn't. It's because that would have required them to flesh out a male character, and that wasn't on the agenda. But what's perhaps more important than establishing the setting and characters, the first five minutes of a movie should be spent setting a tone and letting the audience know what they're in for. Now, to be fair, that's exactly what this scene is doing. It's letting us know that this whole movie is going to consist of directionless, unfunny quips delivered by flat, unlikable characters, interspersed with loud, cartoonishly exaggerated cartoon antics in lieu of a well-thought-out plot. Anyway, we cut to our protagonist, a physics professor named Aaron Gilbert, meeting up with her boyfriend Phil at Columbia University, where they work. And we immediately get the sense that she's socially awkward and embarrasses herself and others in front of her more accomplished peers. She starts preparing for a big lecture when suddenly, a guy named Ed Bulgrave comes in. He runs the museum at Aldridge Mansion and wants Aaron to help them get rid of the ghost. She turns him down, but then he shows her a book about ghosts published in her name. It turns out her former friend, Abby, has posted a book they wrote together years ago on productplacement.com, I mean Amazon. 
This threatens her reputation and tenure because, as we all know, no self-respecting university would give tenure to a professor who believes in such blatantly absurd ideas. Oh wait. Aaron's boss, the guy from Game of Thrones, comes in to talk to her about her upcoming tenure review, and she doesn't want him to see the Amazon listing of the ghost book with her name on it, so she covers up her computer screen because this physics professor doesn't know how to close a browser. Game of Thrones guy leaves and walks past a bust of Harold Ramis because this movie wants to rub it in our faces that Ghostbusters 3 was never made. F*** you. So Aaron goes to the Kenneth P. Higgins Institute of Science to confront Abby, who's a researcher there. I guess because all Ghostbusters have to be former university professors or researchers. Or at least the white ones do. In a scene that's tediously interrupted by Abby complaining about the wontons she ordered. Aaron tells Abby to take the book listing down, but Abby refuses. Abby wanders off to call the Chinese restaurant to complain about her wontons and derail the scene again. And then we're introduced to Abby's partner, Holtzman, an eccentric weirdo who wears the same smarmy, coprophagic smile on her face for the whole movie. Our ghost experts mispronounce electronic voice phenomenon. Not, there's EVP no EVP. Is electro, oh. electro voice phenomenon. I'm familiar. I know what it means. And then we get a queef joke. <laughs> Disgusting. Is it more or less disgusting if I tell you it came from the front? I guess because a comedy with women in it has to have queef jokes. Was this it, ladies? Was this the moment you decided you could relate to these characters? Do you feel represented now? Does the pure feminine energy of the sisterhood of the stinky pants vibrate with you and your uniquely feminine frequencies? Was this the queef joke that made you decide that this movie, a symbol of female solidarity, was so worth defending from the scornful slings and arrows of the patriarchy? Do you raise your fist in righteous fury while sitting in a bathtub blowing bubbles? Stay angry, furious sisters and mothers. Blow that trumpet. Let it be your war cry in the battle for equality. Jesus Christ. Anyway, since Erin is too stupid to realize that she can just sue Abby for publishing a book in her name without her permission, she is about to give up and leave when Abby asks her why she came by. Erin tells her about Mr. Mulgrave complaining about the Aldridge Mansion being haunted, then Abby and Holtzman run out to go to the museum. Erin runs after them and begs Abby to take down her book, so Abby agrees if she introduces them to Mr. Mulgrave. Act 1, Sequence 2, Predicament and Lock-In. Aaron, Abby, and Holtzman show up at the Aldridge Mansion. There's an almost funny gag where Aaron says Mr. Mulgrave asked for her, but the tour guy thinks she's talking about Mr. Mulgrave's dead father, but the gag is ruined by Abby and Holtzman's inability to just shut the f up and let it sit. Ted Mulgrave died 15 years ago. Yes! That's awesome! Dead for 15 years! Ed's a ghost! Ah! Knew it! Anyway, we get a weird, abrupt, hard cut. You're gonna die in there. Aldrich Mansion, take one. And then they're in the mansion looking for signs of paranormal activity with a thing called a PKE meter, which looks nothing like the one from the original movie. I could make some stupid joke about how this one looks like a sex toy, but I'm not this movie's target audience. Aaron steps on some slime and feels the need to touch the unidentified substance with her bare hand because she's an idiot. And then the basement door opens by itself. She accuses Abby and Holtzman of trying to prank her, but then the PKE meter starts freaking out. After another product placement... How can you be eating right now? Once you pop. They encounter a bad CGI thing. I mean, uh, the ghost of Gertrude Aldridge, who proceeds to vomit ectoplasm at Aaron, and then flees into the street and is never seen, heard from, or talked about again until the end of the movie. The gang celebrates that they got a real ghost on video, but then it turns out Abby uploaded the video to product placement, I mean YouTube, where it was seen by Game of Thrones guy who, believing it's fake, fires Aaron. Aaron walks through the hallway with her stuff in an overly long scene where the joke is just LOL, how embarrassing, stretched out to 45 seconds, and then she goes to Abby's laboratory to yell at her about how she got her fired. Aaron tries to assure Aaron that they have an opportunity now and shows her the comments they got on YouTube. Ain't no bitches gonna hunt no ghosts. Oh, no. Abby suggests they make a business out of investigating paranormal activity, and then with perfect and convenient timing, the TV, which was totally silent until now, shows the intro to one of those bogus ghost hunting shows, and then the TV turns off between cuts because Paul Feig forgot to get a shot of someone picking up a TV remote. Now, you might be thinking they're gonna start a rivalry with the guys from the ghost hunting show, but that doesn't happen. It's just another Chekhov's gun that never gets fired. 
Anyway, now that they have actually seen a ghost, Abby feels emboldened to ask her boss, played by someone funny comedian, to give her department more funding. But he refuses and says he didn't even realize they still worked there. So Abby and Holtzman end up losing their jobs in another tediously long and unfunny gag. I have two words for you. Let me guess, get out? No, he's gonna say suck it. He's not gonna say suck it. Suck it. You were right. Oh my gosh, I think it might be a ghost. Oh no, it's not, it's just a bird. See, it's funny because he's like a college genie. He's acting all stupid and immature. Ha ah, ha, did you get it? Why aren't you laughing? He just told them to suck it and flipped it on off. It's funny. How are you not laughing? Maybe we need to draw this gag out a little longer. Do you think it's funny now? No, what's wrong with you? Are you misogynist or something? Do you hate women's fart noise? Aaron comes up with the idea to prove that ghosts are real by catching one. So she, Abby, and Holtzman steal the equipment from the college and get away with it because a movie where three women get the tampon speed out of them by the police wouldn't sell a lot of Pringles and Papa John's pizzas. And then we cut to the subway where we're introduced to Patty, a sassy black woman who works as a clerk because that's the only job a black woman qualifies for in the progressive world of Ghostbusters 2016. And yes, I realized that Winston in the original Ghostbusters was also a non-scientist, but the difference is that movie made in the mid-80s wasn't trying to sell itself as progressive. A strange man walks up to her and says some creepy sh** that makes him sound like some kind of crazy cultist. When the fourth cataclysm begins, laborers such as yourself will be among the last led to the butchery. So, make the most of your extra time. Patty decides to follow this creepy guy down the dark subway tunnel, I guess because that just seems like a good idea to her. And then she sees another device like the one we saw at the mansion earlier. Then a ghost appears and she runs away screaming like the strong, independent woman she is. We then cut to the Mercado Hotel, where we see the strange man from the subway, Rowan, a privileged white male who lives in the basement and works as a janitor, talking to himself in the mirror about how he's been bullied his whole life. He's the villain of this movie because nobody is more worthy of scorn and vilification than a downtrodden working class white man. Just ask Hillary Clinton. Anyway, Aaron, Abby, and Holtzman shop around for a building they can set up the new lab in, but the one they want costs too much and this causes Aaron to waste their only PG-13 F-bomb, which wasn't in the theatrical version. The rent is 21000 a month. F*** you. So it turns out the only place they can afford is a loft above a Chinese restaurant. The same Chinese restaurant that Abby keeps ordering food from, even though they keep screwing up her order and take too long to deliver. How does it take you an hour to go up one flight of stairs? I have a better question. Why don't you just shuffle your fat ass down the stairs and get the food yourself? Act 2, Sequence 3, First Obstacles and Raising the Stakes. Aaron, Abby, and Holtzman start setting up the new lab. Holtzman dances because funny movies gotta have dancing in them. And then we're introduced to Kevin, played by the prick who plays that stupid comic book version of Thor in those dumb movies with the purple guy. He's here to apply for the receptionist job, and Aaron is immediately smitten by him like she's a hormonal teenage girl or something. Are you seeing uh, anyone right now? <clears throat> He could be an axe murderer for all she knows, but I guess because he's tall, handsome, muscular, and has a sexy foreign accent, that's all she cares about. Anyone want to talk about unattainable beauty standards and objectification? Anyway, this leads to the cringe-worthy my cat scene. Oh, I don't have a cat. He's a dog. His name's my cat. Your dog's name is my cat? And Mike Hat. Your dog's name is Mike. Last name Hat. Well, his full name is Michael Hat. Then Kevin shows off some of his graphic design work. We get some more product placements. And we quickly realize that Kevin is some kind of moron. In fact, he is so stupid that he took the lenses out of his glasses so they wouldn't get dirty. And he covers his eyes when he hears a loud noise. God, that's loud, huh? It's loud. It's loud. <laughs> Are you starting to notice a pattern? Just about all of the male characters so far have been portrayed as cowardly, mean, lazy, stupid, or some combination thereof. It's like they don't know how to elevate a female character, so instead, they just lower the male characters to make the female characters look better by comparison. Well, that's one way to achieve equality, just lower the bar. Anyway, even though Kevin is a moron, they still hire him because he's the only one who applied for the job. Also, our strong female protagonists need a big, strong man to carry their equipment up the stairs. No, that's not me being sexist. The movie says it. We need help around here. We cannot keep carrying that equipment up here. So Kevin leaves to do whatever it is Australians do when no one's looking, and then they meet Patty, who has come looking for them. 
she points out a completely irrelevant fact about the Chinese restaurant for no reason other than to let the audience know that her thing is knowing random facts about places in New York so she could serve as a convenient exposition machine. And then she tells them she saw a ghost. We cut to the subway where Patty gives some exposition about how the subway was built under an old prison where they used to execute prisoners. And then she catches some guy spraying graffiti on a wall. And they ask him if he's witnessed any paranormal activity. Have you seen a class four semi-anchored entity? You talking like a boat? Can you speak English? I'm being specific. Let me clear. Let me. Hi. Have you seen a ghost? The guy says he's seen a ghost and proceeds to draw one, but Patty yells at him, so he crosses it out. And then he says, we see it looks nothing like the ghost in the subway. But I guess this movie needed to explain how the Ghostbusters got their logo, and this was the best idea they could come up with. Patty leads them down the subway tunnel and shows them the spot where she saw the weird device, and then they smell electrical discharge and isotropic decay. What is that? Wait, I'm smelling both electrical discharge and isotopic decay. Fun fact. When Sony was promoting this movie, they tried to claim the ghost hunting technology was based on real science. Suddenly, the ghost shows up, and then it just kind of floats there, watching them while they spend 40 seconds setting up their prototype proton beam. After politely waiting, it attacks, and then they manage to restrain it, but are unable to capture it. Just before it gets them, this non-corporeal being gets hit by a train. And they lose their prototype, but they don't seem too bothered by the fact that they almost died. They almost got killed! Yeah, I know. It was so awesome. It was awesome. Sometime later, they're reading the comments on their latest video, and everyone thinks it's fake because the movie doesn't understand how the internet works. Then Kevin brings Abby some coffee, spits in it, then Aaron drinks it because that's funny. They start examining the remains of the device Rowan left in the subway, but then it turns out Patty's there and, even though it doesn't make sense and is never explained, she wants to join them. And even though she doesn't know anything about science or ghosts, they decide to let her join because she can get them a car. Yes, that's literally the only reason. You get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. <laughs> so that's what Patty contributes to the gang. Act 2, Sequence 4, First Culmination Slash Midpoint. We cut to the Mercado Hotel where Rowan catches from some old lady complaining about slime dripping on her, and she doesn't realize she has a bad CGI effect growing out of her back. He goes into a secret lab and talks to some mirrors with ghost hands, then we cut back to the Chinese restaurant where Holtzman and Abby explain the new proton packs and ghost trap. Then Abby tests out the proton pack in the alley, where it makes her fly around like a cartoon character holding a fire hose. We get a quick scene of Rowan going to a rock concert with malicious intent, then we cut to the girls eating another product placement. And yes, I realize the original Ghostbusters also had product placements, but they were far fewer and, except for the Twinkie analogy, it didn't go out of its way to draw attention to them. Erin explains that when she was little, she saw the same ghost every night for a year. But Abby was the only person who believed her, and that's how they became friends. But then, instead of getting a touching and emotional scene about how two girls bonded over their common trauma and slowly drifted apart as they grew up, we just abruptly cut to more dancing. Normal is normal! So Erin and Abby reenact a presentation they made for school when they were kids. And this includes some exposition about how there's some sort of barrier that separates the world of ghosts from the world of humans, which is why we don't see ghosts more often. How they could possibly know this is never explained. They'll give us all kinds of techno babble explaining how the proton packs work, but they won't explain this. But then they see a news report about their recent subway video, and a skeptic played by Bill Murray, who clearly doesn't want to be there, but was forced to be in the movie under threat of legal action by Sony, according to leaked emails. Bill Murray says the video is fake, then they get a phone call from the Stonebrook Theater, where someone saw a ghost. The girls rush outside to the car, but then Phil shows up. Yeah, Phil, remember him? The boyfriend character who just kind of disappeared from the movie until now, and doesn't appear again after the scene, and is so unimportant that he was cut out of a theatrical version entirely? Yeah, he's here now, and he gets in an argument with Aaron while Patty objectifies him. Then Holtzman shows up with a newly minted Ghostmobile, and they drive away while an obnoxious remix of a Ghostbusters theme plays. If there's something weird, and it don't look good, who can you call? Ghostbusters! The girls arrive at the theater and suit up, then go inside and meet the manager. Are you the Ghostbusters? Actually, we're the conductors of the, the we're, physical. Yes, we're the Ghostbusters. 
Oh, so now Aaron's the one who does the techno babble while Abby talks normal. Have you seen a class four semi-anchored entity? You talking like a boat? Can you speak English? I'm being specific. Let me clear. Let me. Hi, have you seen a ghost? See, the thing about letting your actors ad-lib all their lines is you end up with inconsistent characterization. Or maybe it's just bad writing. I don't know who to blame. The manager leads them into the basement where the ghost was sighted. Like the geniuses they are, the Ghostbusters decide to split up. And yes, they did this in the original movie, but they at least acknowledged how stupid it was. I think we better split up. Good idea. Yeah, we can do more damage that way. Abby finds another one of those devices, then Patty gets creeped out by a room full of mannequins. Okay, yep. Room full of nightmares. Not going in there. This woman is hunting ghosts. Patty gets chased by a possessed mannequin and they all shoot at it, revealing some kind of dragon ghost. Okay, so is this the ghost of a dragon? Like there was a dragon living in the theater at some point and that died and became a ghost? Or was it a human ghost that turned into a dragon ghost somehow? How, how does this work? In any case, the dragon ghost escapes and flies above the stage where the concert is happening and everyone just thinks it's part of the show, including the band, who I guess didn't talk to the special effects guys before the show. And the band keeps playing even after it attacks their front man. The Ghostbusters rush onto the stage and shoot at the ghost, and Abby body surfs across the theater. Patty tries it too, but no one catches her. Okay, so I don't know if it was a race thing or a lady thing, but I'm mad as hell. Well, they caught Abby and she's technically a lady, so what do you think? So Patty gets up and, for no reason, the dragon ghost perches on her shoulders. And I guess it doesn't weigh anything. The Ghostbusters all start shooting the proton packs at it, and Holtzman decides now would be a good time to tell Aaron not to cross the streams because it'll make your atoms explode. They pull out the ghost trap and manage to catch the thing, and then everyone cheers. Also, Ozzy Osbourne is there. Wankers, Black 70, that sh in 74. Because he had nothing better to do. The Ghostbusters go outside and talk to the press, and then Rowan sees them on the TV and realizes they're a threat to his plans. Act 2, Sequence 5, Subplot and Rising Action. Now normally this is where a subplot would become evident, but this movie doesn't really have a subplot, so this section's gonna be kinda short. We get yet more dancing because that's funny. Aaron sexually harasses Kevin, but it's fine because she's a woman, and as we all know, it's always funny when a man is a victim of sexual harassment. But don't you dare criticize this movie because that's sexist. F*** you. Holtzman rambles off a bunch of techno babble, and then Bill Murray shows up and immediately sits down because he refused to do the scene standing up. He accuses them of faking the ghost catching thing, so they show him the ghost trap, and he wants them to open it, but they refuse, so he calls them liars. So then the brilliant genius Aaron lets her ego get the better of her, and she releases the greatest scientific discovery since the invention of the microwave bacon rack, and immediately knocks Bill Murray out a window, killing him, and symbolically killing your childhood in the process. Sometime later, the Ghostbusters are explaining what happened to the police, when these government guys show up and tell them the mayor wants to talk to them. They take him to the mayor who tells them they've been seeing ghosts all over the city, and the Ghostbusters tell them they've been finding devices around town which attract and amplify paranormal activity. We believe that someone is creating a device that attracts and amplifies paranormal activity. Y you mean like a Ouija board? Then the mayor tells them they need to make the public believe the Ghostbusters are frauds because they don't want anyone to know about the ghost invasion. The government guys drop the Ghostbusters off at their Chinese restaurant and talk down to them before they leave. The U.S. government doesn't need the help of hobbyists, okay? So go back upstairs to your little dim sum tea party, okay? And leave it to us. Then we cut to the back alley again where Holtzman shows off some more anti-ghost weapons or whatever, and we get a montage of them destroying things. And nobody hears the explosions and calls the police on them because three out of four of them are white, and so they still have white privilege. We then cut to inside where the Ghostbusters see the mayor's assistant calling them frauds on the news. Then Kevin asks them about the thing that killed Bill Murray, apparently not knowing that he works for a ghost catching company. Then Abby talks about the ghost sightings reported around town. Aaron marks them on a map and they form a pad in which they call Ley Lines, which Abby explains is some kind of invisible current of supernatural energy that covers the Earth. I wish I could lay down some lines right about now. 
The Ghostbusters realize the bad guy, who they still don't know is Rowan at this point, is using the mystery devices to charge the ley lines, so he can create a vortex at the point of intersection and release a ghost army to destroy the world. And this intersection is at the Mercado Hotel. And Patty coincidentally notices Rowan in a random staff photo as the guy she saw in the subway just before the ghost appeared. Act 2, Sequence 6, Main Culmination Slash End of Act 2. They drive down to the Mercado. We get a cameo from Ann Potts because she had nothing better to do. Then they head into the basement and find Rowan's laboratory. Yes, Rowan has a huge secret Dexter's laboratory. I guess because he's the only maintenance guy who works in this gigantic hotel, and he's the only one who ever goes into the basement. They meet Rowan and tell him to knock off the sh**, and he rants about how we live in a society. Behind these are millions of souls. Souls who have been cast aside. Who see the world as it truly is, as garbage. Garbage that needs to be cleaned up. They're mostly dudes. What does them being mostly dudes have to do with anything? Is the movie implying it's mostly men who hate the world? Because that wouldn't be the case if anybody actually cared about the fact that men account for 80% of suicides. I don't see any football teams changing their colors for a month to bring awareness to that. Abby tries to talk Rowan out of ending the world by reminding him about the good things in life, but she can only think of soup. There's so many terrific things out there that are worth living for. You, you, got, you got soup and, you know, that... Oh god, I can only think of soup. I think the reason she can only think of soup is because they desperately wanted to do a cliché fat joke here, but they didn't want to imply she could only think of pie or cake because they got scared somebody would call it body shaming and sexist, so they compromised and made her say soup. But that doesn't work, so Abby resorts to telling Rowan the police are coming, so he just kills himself. He could have just pulled the switch anyways, maybe he thought the police would arrest the ghost or something, I don't know. Sometime later, the police are looking around, and the Ghostbusters realize Rowan has been reading the book Aaron and Abby wrote, and that's how he learned how to open a ghost portal. So really, this is all Aaron and Abby's fault. The mayor's assistant and government guys start a cover-up, and we cut to the basement where we see the PKE meter going off to let us know something bad is about to happen. I, I guess they just left it there. The Ghostbusters start walking back because the mayor's assistant had their car towed for no reason, and then Carl the Cuck walks up behind them and starts pestering them for his blog. Aaron gets mad and punches him, and this ends up on the front page of the New York Post because the New York Times didn't want anything to do with this movie. Then they see Game of Thrones guy in the news calling Aaron an asshole. Aaron storms off and then Kevin runs up and tells Abby he wants to be a Ghostbuster, just out of the blue and with no explanation, but Abby tells him to f*** off. We then cut to Aaron in her apartment or whatever, looking at the book they found in Rowan's lab, and it's full of foreboding doodles. Back at the Chinese restaurant, Abby hears a knock at the door, but no one's there, so she locks herself in the bathroom. I guess it doesn't take much to scare someone who studies ghosts. She hears the pipe wiggling under the sink and sees an ominous green light in the drain, and like the genius she is, she gets good and close to it. Abby then hears the voice of Rowan giving a villain monologue. It's brilliant, really. My devices energize spectral entities on a nuclear paramolecular level. Then she starts projectile vomiting all over the bathroom. Aaron tries to call the Chinese restaurant, but no one answers. Then, conveniently, Aaron happens to see a news report about the mayor meeting with some diplomats at a place called Lotus Leaf. Back at the Chinese restaurant, Abby comes out of the bathroom, and the genius ghost expert Holtzman can't tell that she's possessed just based on the way she's acting. So Abby proceeds to start smashing up the ghost hunting equipment. Then, even after exerting superhuman strength to throw Holtzman across the room, Patty doesn't catch on that she's possessed. See, Abby, I told you to have that sandwich, man. Low blood sugar is serious. Abby grabs Holtzman by the throat and dangles her from the window. Patty stops her. Abby does the exorcist head spin thing that every comedy movie involving the supernatural feels the need to parody. I guess that's what clues them in that Abby's possessed. Patty then literally slaps the ghost out of her and somehow doesn't see the giant glowing specter fly out the window. Oh, that's gonna leave a mark. The power of Patty compels you! You Abby? idiot. Then Kevin is inexplicably outside, inexplicably demanding they let him be a Ghostbuster, and oblivious to the broken glass on the ground and the ghost flying right above him, which he should have seen if he was outside looking up at the window. But Kevin's an idiot, so that excuses all sorts of bad writing. They try to tell him to look out for the ghost, but it goes into him, and then the possessed Kevin gets on a motorcycle and drives off. 
Now, it should be pointed out that, in the theatrical version, Kevin never once expressed interest in becoming a Ghostbuster before this point, so him demanding it just came out of nowhere and felt even weirder and more out of place than it does here. Anyway, we cut to Lotus Leaf where Aaron barges in on the mayor's dinner and hysterically tells him he needs to evacuate the city before the ghosts kill everyone. She grabs onto the table and continues to yell as the security guys carry her out. Rowan, still possessing Kevin, returns to his lab, beats up the two cops guarding it, then proceeds to turn his machine on, releasing the ghosts. Panic breaks out in the streets as a dark cloud blocks out the sun and the ghosts run rampant. Now, to the movie's credit, when Rowan possesses Kevin's body, they don't do that stupid thing you see during body swapping plots in cartoons or dumb movies based on cartoons, where you hear the voice of the person whose minds got transplanted into the new body coming out of the mouth of the new body as if he took his vocal cords with him. I can look at myself naked. We don't hear Rowan's voice coming from Kevin's mouth, which is more realistic in this movie about ghosts, but he does speak with Kevin's accent. Oh, because of the glasses and the handsomeness. <laughs> which doesn't really make any sense because accents are learned, unlike voices which are determined by the physical structure of your throat. Maybe they just didn't want to do any ADR, and Chris Hemsworth didn't feel like doing an American accent. But I understand, acting is hard. Act 3, Sequence 7, New Tension and Twist Aaron tries to make her way back to the lab and flags down a cab being driven by Dan Aykroyd because f*** you. But he drives away, and, and Abby Holtzman and Pabby try to rush down to the Mercado to close the portal, but they find the road is blocked with debris. As they try to clear a path, Slimer from the original movie steals their car, and they can't shoot at him because the car has a nuclear reactor on it. Why does the car have a nuclear reactor? No reason. So Slimer gets away with their car, the military shows up, then as the girls make their way to the hotel on foot, they get attacked by ghostly parade balloons. I guess because these inanimate objects died and became ghosts. One of the balloons, which looks like the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, pins them down, but then Aaron shows up out of nowhere and rescues them. How she managed to get to the lab to get her ghost busting equipment, and then find them in the middle of the city on foot in such a small time frame, is never explained. Maybe she just followed the fish smell. They then run to the Mercado where Rowan, still in Kevin's body, makes all the police and army guys dance disco style, because as this movie has proven several times already, dancing is hilarious. I guess because he could just do that now. But then he sees the Ghostbusters walking up and freezes the army guys, but I guess he can't freeze the Ghostbusters. So then he summons all the ghosts to fight them right in the middle of Times Square, for no reason other than it serves as an excuse to plaster the screen with ads. The ghosts conveniently all line up on one side instead of just rushing the Ghostbusters from every direction. So the Ghostbusters have time to pull out their proton guns and start shooting. Guys, you all have your sidearms. I suggest you use them. Guys? Hey, that's sexist. This leads to the kind of scene that I call a pod race. Let me explain. In Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, there's a scene at the midpoint of the movie where the plot comes to a dead stop for 10 minutes to make way for a bunch of pointless action. The whole purpose of the scene is that Anakin wins the race, meaning Qui-Gon won the bet with Watto so they could get the parts they needed for the spaceship so they could continue the journey to Coruscant. If the entire scene were cut down to one minute, its effect on the plot would have been exactly the same meaning the 10-minute spectacle of loud noises and explosions was basically just an overindulgent special effects reel that was exciting on only the most superficial level and ultimately a big waste of time as far as the story is concerned. That's what this fight scene is. This is the pod race of Ghostbusters. While it's not nearly as egregious as the actual pod race being much shorter, it's still a completely pointless scene that does nothing but fill up time. But it's arguably worse because I struggle to think of any reason for this fight to even be in the movie. At least with the pod race, you could say the point was Qui-Gon needed Anakin to win so they could leave the planet. And you can argue that there was some character development for Anakin because he had never won a race before. And the only real sin of that scene was that it went on for too long without much actually happening. But I can't think of a reason why this fight scene exists in this movie other than to provide a bunch of flashy sh for them to put in the trailer. Meaning this scene is just another marketing ploy in a movie that exists as one big soulless marketing ploy. Maybe the point is to convince us that these ladies are badass action heroes now. I remember in the original Ghostbusters when they arrived at the Gozer building or whatever, and the crowd was cheering for them like they were heroes, and then it hard cuts them struggling to climb the stairs, and it was both funny and made sense because it wasn't an action movie. Anyway, the Ghostbusters win the fight despite a complete lack of combat training thanks to the magic of girl power, and look, 
They even killed Gertrude with no effort and without acknowledging who she is. Gee, I'm sure glad we spent the first 15 minutes of the movie building her up. The Ghostbusters then walk past the Frozen Army guys, see Slimer drive by in their car, and go into the hotel where they see a big ghost portal in the middle of the floor. Rowan shows up and leaves Kevin's body, and Kevin falls unconscious to the floor, even though Abby didn't lose consciousness when he possessed her, but whatever. Rowan then takes the form of the Ghostbusters logo and pushes the Ghostbusters outside where they knock over all the soldiers like dominoes. And then he makes himself really big because he could just do that while none of the other ghosts can. And it's never explained why. And he begins stomping around the city, stepping on cars and smashing buildings. The Ghostbusters then realize they can close the portal through the magic of techno battle, and conveniently, Slimer just happens to drive by with their car again, so they get their nuclear-powered car to crash into the portal. Oh, I guess that's why the car had a nuclear reactor. The plot demanded it. <laughs> As the portal closes, all the ghosts get sucked back into the ghost dimension except for Rowan, who's so powerful for some reason that he can resist the pull. The Ghostbusters shoot him in the balls to get him to loosen his grip, and also because fuck men. And then he falls in, but not before he grabs Abby. Aaron ties a cable around her waist and dives into the portal after her. We then get this weirdly dramatic scene where the music gets all slow and serious. Then she catches Abby, Patty and Holtzman pull them out, and for some reason this causes Aaron and Abby's hair to turn white. Maybe it's a Danny Phantom reference or something, I don't know. I just know it also didn't turn their eyebrows white because makeup is hard. Also, everything is conveniently back to normal now. Act 3 Sequence 8, Resolution. The news reports of what happened in New York, and there's some dumb shit about the government trying to cover it up by claiming everyone just hallucinated the ghost because of drugs in the water or something. I guess nobody in a city of 8 million people had their trusty Sony Handycam with them. The Ghostbusters are at a restaurant, Aaron and Abby have dyed their hair, and Holtzman makes a forced and awkward speech about the importance of friendship. And then the mayor's aide shows up and tells them they're willing to fund their research in case they need him again in a sequel, and buys them the building they weren't able to afford earlier. As they move into their new building, Patty's uncle, played by Ernie Hudson, shows up and asks what happened to the hearse he let them borrow. The movie ends with them arguing over the car, and then the credits are intercut with scenes of the Ghostbusters setting up the new lab. We get the conclusion to the stupid wonton soup running gag, we see Kevin is still working for them even though they can afford to hire somebody else now, and Shigourney Weaver shows up to make a mildly sexist joke. Safety lights are for dudes. Safety lights are for dudes. The gang then goes up to the roof and sees the letters GB and We Heart You written in the lit windows as the city thanks them for beating up a poor lonely guy who was lashing out at the world who mistreated him. Yeah, way to go. I won't tell anyone the guy who stopped from destroying the city wouldn't have been able to if he hadn't read your book and that makes it technically your fault to begin with. Woo. Then we get a lot of terrible remixes of the Ghostbusters theme during the rest of the credits, and then we get a post credit sequence teasing a sequel that will never happen. I heard something really weird. What's Zool? F*** you, that's what Zool is. So that's the plot of Ghostbusters 2016. I actually have a lot more to say about it, but this video is already getting pretty long, so I'm gonna have to split it up into parts. I also don't feel like coming up with some kind of ending to this video, so I guess I'm just gonna read off my $10 patrons. Please, social justice, and we'll see you in the next video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. 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 Don't forget to sub